Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start the, the workshop. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, thank you for taking the time to, to participate, to learn a little bit more. Uh, I just want to introduce very quick about WiseLine. What is WiseLine? Uh, some people might, or sometimes people tell me, is WiseLine a, a school or like an education organization? I'm like, no, no, no. Wiseline Academy is part of Wiseline. Wiseline, uh, it's, a, it's a company that develops software. So let me explain you very, very quick about it. Uh, Wiseline uh, was founded around five years ago in San Francisco. Uh, what we do are products and services for our clients. So we help our clients to, to be better, to get better results, to build better applications. Uh, we are in, in Querétaro, Mexico City, Guadalajara, eh, Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam, Bangkok, Thailand, and Barcelona, Spain. Eh, one of the things that speaks a lot about WiseLine is, is our culture. And our culture is about sharing, sharing knowledge internally and externally. And that's why we, we came up with this initiative that is called WiseLine Academy. So WiseLine Academy, it's a, a program that teaches eh, courses in project management, software development, data engineering, technical writing, UX design, and everything is for free for the, for the community. We also have another site that is internal part where we train also our wise liners. So we're very happy to have you here today. Uh, normally our courses are in person, but this situation pushes to, to do creative things and, and actually is working very well. We're very happy to reach more, more of you to reach more, more people in, in Mexico, in LATAM in general, in APAC. So I think it is a good change for us and we're very happy to have you here today. Uh, one last thing is that uh, please enjoy today, please enjoy the hour that you will be here today. I know that sometimes working from home can get, a, you can get a lot of distractions, right? Like. My dog is next to me, so I, I get distracted by, by him or my cell phone, a lot of tabs in my computer. But this hour, just uh, focus on, on what you're doing right now, disconnect from everything and enjoy. Uh, do some networking via, via online. And we hope you, you enjoy uh, today's session. So, Heather, yeah, the mic is, is all yours. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I guess we're doing this in English too. Uh, well, a lot of people say that it's okay in both languages. So in order to not discriminate, we, we're gonna keep it like that. Uh, so this is clean code. And well, uh, first I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you some uh, important notes before starting. Um, as uh, Carolina just mentioned, uh, just general guidelines to enjoy uh, this course. Please mute, mute your microphone along the course and also use the chat. Um, well, here it says that during Q&A sessions, but well, I, we do have a Q&A session at, at, at the end, but I actually would like for you to be really active in the chat. I have it here in another screen, so I'll be watching for anything you have questions and answer at, at, the, at the moment. Um, also, try to focus your questions on, on the topic. Um, turn off your camera if you have connection issues, if you are, uh, listening to choppy audio, then that's that's a good um, way to save your bandwidth. And also recording isn't allowed, so please um, be mindful of that. Uh, also, uh, well, we have a code of conduct, uh, really general, be respect, respectful, and also there are no bad questions or ideas. So in a, even if you know the answer of a question in chat, um, Try to not be rude. Uh, we 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 are. I I just saw the invitation. I mean the the list of uh of people attending, and we have a lot of people from different levels. So try try to be respect, respectful from others. Um, also be uh, welcome and patient. We're gonna start probably with with things that you might know, but uh, I hope that at least you learn something new from, from this course. And also be careful from the words that you use. Remember, we are all humans and we've been locked up for three, four weeks. So yeah, uh, we, we might not be on our best shape right now, but try to be. Uh, so now I'm gonna present myself. 
uh, I'm Eduardo Diaz. I'm a software engineer here at WiseLine. Uh, but well, I, I've been working in web development in general for more than 11 years. And also I'm uh, one of the founders of the WiseLine front-end chapter. So apart from doing clean code every day or trying to do clean code every day, I'm, I'm also a, a front-end advocate. So if you want to uh, know about uh, well, know more about front and other things I do, you can follow me at, in Twitter at uh, this handle. And well, yeah, let's get it started. Uh, this is gonna be the agenda. And we have five topics. Uh, first of all, why does it even matter to have green code? Um, why bother if the code works, right? A lot of people say like, yeah, the code works, it, the program works, so why do I have to have clean code? So we're gonna answer that question. After that, I'm going to give you some guidelines and general rules to, to take into account when, when cleaning code. Um, in the third part, which is uh, the, the, the most different part from other um, blog posts or books that you have read probably on clean code, uh, this is the part where we see common scenarios and how to fix them. So we're going to have some live coding there. And also, I'm, I, I want there for you to be really participative and tell me what you think, what, what should be fixed and so on. So uh, that's like the real deal, like doing uh, real, clean real clean code uh, in real time. So yeah, that, that's gonna be cool. And finally, uh, I'm gonna teach you, uh, an over well, I'm gonna give you an overview on how to enforce clean code uh, with automation and tools. And also an overview of code smells and refactoring, what's it, wh what is it and also, um, how it can help you to take uh, your cleaning technique to the next level. Uh, any questions so far? All good. I, I want to see some activity in the chat. Eh? Cool. So now let me just um, fix where my chat is here. Um, and actually, I don't have my annotation, so I'm going to Stop sharing a little bit because I, I need to, to show the annotations here. Okay, cool. So first of all, now that uh, everyone got writing in the, in the chat, um, what's clean code for you? I wanna see answers. So we, uh, I, I, not, there's no wrong answer. Or I'll tell you if, if one of those answers is a little bit wrong, but don't be shy. Okay, some people saying readable code, human readable code, that's cool. Understandable code, yeah. They follow best practices, uh, readable for humans. Okay, easy to be maintained, yeah, that's very important. Maintainable code, good practices. Okay, yeah, I, I think uh, most of people uh, got some uh, good good guidelines on what's uh, what's clean code, but in general, um, this is really different from team to team. The concrete definition uh, it could vary or could be different from one team to another, uh, but in general, uh, the clean code should sat satisfy the following. First of all, it should do what it should do, right? If it it doesn't work or it can do what you do. Uh, the, that, well, that's pro you could have probably clean code, but if, if it doesn't, doesn't do what it should do, then it, it, it doesn't matter, right? Like why coding something that doesn't do what it should do. So uh, second point is easy to understand. Yeah, I saw uh, many answers with that, uh, with that word, understand. Also easy to adapt that goes into maintainability and easy to maintain. It complements maintainability. Adapt is different. Adapt is, uh, if you work with Scrum and Agile, you know that requirements change. So how easy is your code to adapt? And easy to maintain is also probably your code. Um, you, you will leave it as it is for a couple of months, then get back. Then how easy is it to change uh, um, the, the things that you were doing three months ago, right? So that's why it's different to adapt and to maintain. Cool. So um, now 
the the question or what um, basically the the question of this module is why is this important right um because we are makers right who thinks we are makers like we only do things and like i do my software i throw it away it works that's fine i leave it as it is right uh well yes but actually no <laughs> Uh, we are readers, and actually, um, there are studies that an average developer spends a lot, a lot of more time reading than coding because most of the time you're working uh, with code. Um, even if you're in a new project, there will be a time where you will need to read uh, the code that you have already made to understand things because your head cannot get all of it uh, together and remember everything perfectly, right? So we almost always read a lot more than what, what we code, right? Uh, also, there's a really high possibility that the code we write will be read by, by someone else. It could be us in the future. And this might be a controversial topic uh, or, or affirmation, but code is the only documentation that you can really trust. Comments, documents, manuals, diagrams, all of those things that you do beside your code uh, will get stale and or will lack specific details. So there will be a, a point in time where all of those things will, will need to be refreshed. And even so, if you refresh them, they won't be as exact as the code because the code is like the source of truth, right? So the other reason uh, to have clean code is because time is money. When code is clean, uh, you, you, you can make changes without having to rely on your memory. What I mentioned before, uh, you can change uh, things knowing that uh, by reading them, if, it, if, the clone, if, the, if the code is clean, you can just read them and know what they're doing. If, if the code is not clean, you will have to spend a lot of time understanding what, what it's trying to do. Uh, also, uh, changes will not require happy, hacky solutions uh, most of the time. Uh, and that's because the, the code will be easy to adapt. Like we mentioned that the third point in, in the first slide. And something really important if you work with a team, new devs will not annoy you with a lot of questions. And if you're more like a project manager or, or a CTO or owner of, of a company, your devs can easily transition between one project to another if the clean is code. I mean, the code is clean because they will be uh, easily ramped up without having to read a lot of manuals or training and stuff like that, right? So if this is what clean code can do, then what can bad code do, right? The thing with bad code is that uh, it's a silent killer. You can also call it tech dev. It's basically uh, everything that starts piling up and all, all the bad code that it's piling up it's not being cleaned, so it starts killing your, your product. How? Well, it is a cycle. Basically, um, well, it starts be, uh, when the system becomes hard to change, right? So if you don't have clean code, you will spend more time changing the system. Then that will uh, cause that the bugs that your users are reporting are remaining longer in the system. So you will spend most of your time squashing bugs, which will lead to more of them because the code is not clean. So probably you squash one, but another three come out. Also uh, creating features start, stops being a priority because most of the people of the users start complaining about your bugs or, and they're not being fixed. So your product starts lacking behind, right? Then, um, in consequence, the product provides less business value to your users. And then uh, the budget for a project starts to decrease because you start losing customers, right? So, so that, that cycle will repeat until basically your product is done and you can no longer maintain it and, and it will be killed. So that's why clean code is important. It, it can be uh, um, something that kills your software. And most of the time when this, this happened, mo most people will uh, just say that it was fault of the project manager. They didn't know how to manage things. 
but in reality it's just uh, that, that there's clean code missing and you cannot advance as fast as you as you wanted. Every, everyone's okay with this or anyone has any other uh, point of view on this topic? Nope, I would. Okay. So if now that we know all of this, why do we do bad code? Anyone can think of an, an excuse you have given when, when someone, um, well, if, if I will ask you, why do you, did you do that bad code? How would you answer that? Okay, time, target dates, yeah, lack of time. Mm -hmm. You have to accomplish a deadline, yeah. Ah, uh, you'll I'll fix it later, yeah. <laughs> the deadline changed, right? People are ready, yeah, that's right. You're just experts. You're basically repeating what I'm gonna say here in the bullet. So yeah, temporary fixes. My my way to code is better. Yeah, that's a good one. And lack of knowledge. Yeah, definitely. You don't know all the features provided by the language. That's right. That's lack of expertise problem. You're probably a junior developer. Or you're just you're just learning the language. So yeah, that's true. Nobody is watching. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Um, so. Yeah, the first one, I didn't have time to think about a clean stru structure for, for my code. Yeah, that goes along with the deadlines and everything time related. So if you don't have time and basically you're doing things uh, in a rush, that's the, you, you could uh, keep in fault your client or, or anyone else, but actually it, it, also, it, it is also part of our professionalism. Imagine a doctor that if you tell him, hey, doctor, I'm dying. You have to, uh, to do something so I stop dying, right? And you have to do it really, really fast. Then the doctor will tell you something like, oh, I need to wash my hands first. But since you are rushing him, you, you will tell him something like, you should not uh, wash your hand because you will lose time on that and you need to fix me right now, right? So uh, if the doctor wasn't a professional, he will do that. Just try to fix you without cleaning his hands or her hands. And, and basically we'll fix you, but we'll probably uh, get you some bacteria or something that could cause problems in the future to you, right? And that's not professional. So part of being more professional or being a professional is to uh, take a stance and basically say, no, you know what? I want to do things right. And even if you put this deadline, I need to push back and tell you uh, to, to do things right. So you have to do a back and forth with your project managers or whoever is doing these deadlines because, or, or at least giving them uh, the, uh, their advice that if you do that, there will be problems in the future, right? And pro probably even better document that you will have problems in the future so that you can say in the future, say, see, I, I told you. So yeah, that, that's the way I, you, you should handle that. Um, so th this is one that you mentioned greedy. I built this project, so I am the only one who should understand the code. So yeah, there's people that is greedy. And yeah, we we need to be team players. So try to, we, we, the, the way we uh, is doing reviews, and we're, we're gonna see that later. But basically there's no one that should be the, the person that only knows that module or that part, part of the program. Everyone should know a little bit of everything or at least know about uh, parts of the project. So yeah, not, there, there should not be a hero developer that like you just mentioned in, in the chat. Uh, yeah, the customer was pressing me, so I wrote quickly. That's another one, same as, uh, as the first one, basically. I'll fix it later. Um, later never happens, so don't be lazy. <laughs> try, try to fix as much as possible uh, when, when you have the context, because probably if you fix it right now, it will take you 10, 15 minutes. But if you fix it later, let's say a week later, uh, you will spend more than those 15 minutes because you will, you will need to get into the context of that part of the project and then uh, do the fix. So uh, yeah, try to not post, uh, postpone the, the fixes. 
and this code has better performance. I'm not sure if someone mentioned this, but I think this is the most valid one for not doing clean code because uh, I've seen a project where you need performance and you, if you do it in a clean way, you will lose performance, right? But there's a thing, there's code with good performance and code with good performance. Basically, uh, the, the performance on, on a project follows the 80-20 rule, you know, 80% uh, of the processing time of, of a project is just in 20% of the code. So that means um, that you basically, you, you, you might have 20% of bad code in a project or you might allow to have 20% of, of bad code in a project, but in reality, we don't know what's that 20%. That's something theoretical, right? We, we won't know if we have that 20% or worse or, or um, code that needs performance if we only have bad code everywhere. So what I will suggest is that you try to do code with, um, well, as clean as possible. And later, if you need to optimize that 20%, uh, you can make more informed and a better trade-offs of which parts should, should uh, be uh, less clean, to say it in a way, uh, to, to be performant and, or, or to improve the performance. Uh, someone wants, wants to talk about this or has an experience on doing performant code that doesn't look good? No. But and also in my experience, even if you do bad code, you, you can probably do some clean code practices to improve it. Um, oh, okay, I'm having some answers here. Sometimes the member focus on micro enhancements. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, basically, uh, yeah, some, some things that we say that, oh, this is better performance is just like obscure tricks that we read in, in a post or something. Uh, but in reality, they're not needed because that's probably not that critical part of a project, right? So yeah, that, that's another thing that uh, you, you can use that weapon to anyone that says uh, this is more performant than you say, is this a critical part of your or the project? Or basically you, you can uh, you, you, you can mention to that person if the trade-off is okay to have less readable code, because if it, if it is performant, if it's, a critical part, then it's okay. If it's not a critical critical part, it's better to have it performing. Okay, so now um, clean code uh, guidelines. Sorry, I'm I'm seeing uh, here something. Are you seeing this brush thing, or it's just me? Yeah, let, let me remove that. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure who, who was, uh, uh, who, who did that, but I just removed it. Uh, so now for guidelines, uh, the clean code book, this is the Bible. This is the reference for all of this. If you, well, most of the course is based on this. Uh, I don't have the whole book in this course, of course, uh, but basically if you want to go deeper, you should read this book. Also what I'm gonna teach you is gonna be, well, the examples are, are in JavaScript, but this code has Java um, examples. So if you're more, uh, if you're, you use a, a, a language that is more class-based or you want to, um, to use more of the things that Java does and, and have a better understanding on, on clean code on, on that specific platform, this book is really good for you. But even if you're, the, you're not using Java or, or you're using JavaScript or any other language, this code is also awesome. So, um, so now these are my guidelines. These, these are not the books. So the, the, the book has like 20 chapters, something like that. And I'm just gonna give you uh, five categories, which are not the whole book, but I think it's, uh, these are the most important, at least for starting and then follow up, uh, up with the book. So um, the, the first one is meaningful names. Um, we, we're gonna see in detail each of these ones, but yeah. Um, the second one is the sing single responsibility principle. Probably you, you've seen that uh, mentioned in, a, a lot in, in, in blog posts or things you've read. Comments, error handling, and writing for your peers, including your future self. So everything we're gonna do today, uh, the exercises, all of those things will fall into these uh, five categories. So 
if you can identify uh, everything we do, you, you can basically uh, put them in one of, the, of these five categories. Uh, so for the first one, meaningful names. Uh, naming is hard. Uh, so yeah, uh, basically, uh, well, there, there's another saying that uh, naming is, is one of the two things more difficult in, in computer science. So yeah. Uh, so what uh, what should we do to avoid uh, ha not having, well, what should we do to, to have meaningful names? So basically names should be self-documenting. That means that uh, by themselves, the variables or, or any, uh, uh, well, someone in the chat is saying that they, they draw the line, that's okay, don't worry. Uh, uh, name, name should be self-documenting. You should be, uh, um, your, your variable names, your function names, your classes, everything you, you write in code should be uh, self-documenting. If not, you will have to have a manual or something and it's not really comfortable to read the code and then get back to the manual and so on. So it's better to have good names. Uh, also a, a good tip is to have the same vocabulary as a business. Um, so uh, all of the software we do has a business purpose, right? So ba basically if um, we call our customers customers, then let's call it in the code also customers, but probably we, we have many types of customers. For example, if we are uh, running a, um, a newspaper and we have authors, we probably have editors. So if we just call all of them users, that's not that's not good. We, we're not gonna be able to differentiate that. It's better to call them just like that, like, oh, this is an author, this is an editor, this is an administrator, etc. right? So that's why I mentioned use the same vocabulary as the business. Uh, also try to be consistent, same, same thing. When, um, when, when you name something, try to name it the same way in all of your project. Don't, don't use one word like get, and then in other class you use fetch to, to, to fetch or get data, try, or probably you use a third one that is retrieve. So try to keep one for the whole project because it will be uh, really hard to guess that's the word that the, uh, the other people or you used in the past uh, if you keep changing it like that. And no abbreviations. So we've seen this, uh, probably we, we have really uh, bad uh, training in, in our school because in, in, uh, when we were doing coding in school, we were use, using uh, abbreviations or even the professors would use abbreviations, right? Um, also, this goes to anything like, um, uh, for example, if you're working with something that is a manager, uh, if you use M N G R, that's an abbreviation. If if you're working a product that is like a name super long, and you want to do uh, I don't know, like use the first letter of each of of the words, probably that's fine. But I will say that try to avoid that too. Um, what about the long? What do you mean by by long? Uh, oh yeah, how long is it good? Yeah, long names is okay. Um, I don't, I don't think there's a, a limit on long names for, uh, uh, for well, depends on the language. There are languages that limit the, the the name of the variables, but long names are okay as long as they're not super uh, super long because, you know, you have a screen and you have a limited uh, width of characters, so. If, if the whole line of characters is just that name, then that's too long. Um, yeah, also, well, yeah, when you're writing the long names, you can misspell, but there's a lot of editors that do autocomplete, so that's not a problem anymore, I think. But yeah, I, I wouldn't lo go too long or too short. I, 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 there, there are some times that short is okay, and sometimes that you need to be more specific, so longer is okay, but not too long, not too short. We're gonna see some examples in, 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 the, in the exercises to, to see. I, I'm gonna ask you even for, for some names to see if we get a, uh, what, what, what's the difference between a long one and a, and a shorter one and what's the, the, uh, a good, um, yeah, a good, a good one. So 
going on to the next topic. Um, oh, yeah, class, classes, objects, and variables should be nouns. Ah, oh, okay. So there's a question if we use, should use camel case or underscore. That most probably comes from the language. If you were using PHP, I will say underscores. If you were using JavaScript, camel case. But if the language doesn't have something, then you should choose one. And we are going to see how to do that later. But yeah, you and your team should choose one uh, of those two to, to be in, in, in sync. Uh, for classes, objects, and variables, uh, yeah, we should have nouns. Try not to use verbs. And in, in the other side, when you're using methods, you should have verbs and not nouns, right? Like, when, like get something. Uh, present tense means that, that um, not something in the past, like got or um, ran. Or you, you try to use always in present because when you're reading code, it's like you're reading a story, right? So it's you're, you're reading the present verb uh, of what that function is doing. And finally, try to avoid any generic words. How many of you have used data, helpers, or utils? We even have folders like that, right? So try as much as possible to avoid those, those kind of names. Uh, any questions so far? No? Cool. Yeah, I, I like that you're writing questions as they come. So I'm, I'm going to try to answer all of them as, as you write them. So now for the single responsibility principle, after naming, I, this, this is the most important part of uh, maintainable code. Uh, basically, don't do uh, what this guy is doing. And try to make that everything just do one thing. We call that a one trick pony. So your classes, your functions, everything should be one trick pony. And we're going to see examples because this is the mo most difficult part uh, to understand and to apply. Uh, but we're, we're going to see in the examples uh, um, how can we achieve this. Um, so yeah, functions should only be doing one thing. Um, oh, okay. So question probably back from the naming uh, topic. Objects, classes, variables, what is the suggestion? Plural or singular nouns? Profile or profiles? That depends. If you're handling an array, I will say profiles. If it's just one profile, then the, the singular. Uh, but yeah, try to use plural only when it, it is a list, an array, or something that, that has many of that thing. Uh, okay, so Hugo mentions that it's probably better to put profile list instead of profiles. I will say no, because you are, well, that, that could be tricky because you don't know if it's a linked list or if it is an array. Uh, and if your language is not typed, probably you will expect to be a list. And if it is typed, then that's fine because you will know what exactly it is. But if profile list might, might be something misleading if, if you're using an array, for example. Uh, okay. Uh, how will you rename a folder called utils? I've seen pretty common on multiple kind of projects. Yeah, uh, I will not rename it. I will just try to move those utils where they belong. Uh, most of utils go to, to uh, that utils file or folder because you don't know where they belong. But, but when you start figuring out the business rules and all of that, probably you, you can uh, do a class that has uh, some of those utils, not all of them. It's more like, oh, these utils are for this kind of object. So you should live in this class, right? So in, in the worst case scenario, I will do something like, uh, if you're working with uh, what we mentioned, authors, uh, editors, so probably authors, utils, editors, utils, articles, utils, stuff like that. But uh, try to avoid just utils. And even so, when, when um, if you have those editor utils, probably you can move them to the editor class or something like that. So it depends, but try to move them to, to where they belong. Uh, OK, cool. So. Getting back to single responsibility principle. Uh, also, well, uh, uh, so, something that, that is really important is to separate input and output from the transformation. This is part of the uh, function should be, do, should be doing one thing only, uh, but it's worth mentioning because I've seen a lot of common problems when people have like 
fetching data from an API, then transforming it, and then put it into or rendering into the screen. So all of that happening in just one function. And uh, whenever something needs to change, that uh, that's the main problem when trying to separate things. OK, so other question. Um, Oh, if we work with a functional paradigm, how do you manage the utils? Uh, the same, because uh, function, well, even if you have a functional paradigm where, yeah, you have pure functions and they're most likely utils, you can uh, bind them to, to an entity, right? Most of those functions probably, if they're array utils, well, that's fine, that's array utils. But well, nowadays, uh, most of the functional common functions are in a library. So probably if you need to do new ones because of your business, then they will, I will say they most probably can live in, in a file with that business entity name. Does that answer your question? I mean, if it, you, you must, oh, cool, yeah. So yeah, most, most, most of the time when you have two functions, I mean a function being used by two things, uh, it might be that those two things should be together or I, I'm not sure. Well, all of those, uh, we, we will see later uh, how to define those, but that's a tricky point when, when uh, one function it's kind of generic and you try to use it in many parts, but most of them are binded to, to a business unit or something uh, uh, in your business. Uh, okay, moving forward, uh, functions should not have side effects. And actually this goes uh, with, with the functional programming paradigm probably. Uh, but yeah, when you have side effects, uh, you, you will have problems in, in, um, in your program because, uh, well, we'll see later that also uh, functions should be easy to test. And this is something that makes things not easy to test. And Basically, you, you should not be modifying anything out of the, of the scope of your function. Um, and these three principles, uh, how many of you have heard of them? Like, can, can someone put in the chat what is dry, what is Jackney, and what is Kiss? OK, yeah. So don't repeat yourself, keeping simple, sweetie. I like that one, I should change it. Uh, don't repeat yourself, yeah. So those three that you mentioned, that's it. Don't repeat yourself, you're not gonna need it. And I like the sweetie more because stupid might be rude, but yeah, that's why I crossed it. Uh, but yeah, and basically the first one is like, try not repeating code, try not to repeat code, sorry. Uh, the second one is you, you aren't going to need it. Try to not over-engineer things and, and try to uh, prevent things and keep it simple, which is also basically try uh, don't overcomplicate things. Like uh, if something can, can be solved simpler with less lines, try to do that. Well, not with less line, that's, uh, that's tricky, but more, more like easy to understand. Uh, but the tricky part is that you have to maintain the balance between th these three things. Sometimes they they uh, they don't go together. Uh, for example, you you might want to avoid code duplication, and you will try to abstract something that you see duplicated. But if you don't abstract it correctly, you might have problems, um, uh, some maintenance problem, because you are basically over engineering. If you abstract something that shouldn't have been abstracted at that moment it's part of you aren't gonna need it. So uh, basically you're, you're putting things are difficult in the future. I'm, I'm gonna teach you some, some examples in the exercise for this because probably right now it's just words and it's more difficult, but uh, basically I'm, I just want you to keep uh, with sometimes repeating code is good because no abstraction is better than having the wrong, wrong abstraction, right? So don't try the, to do these three things like if it was, uh, a super strict rule. The rules are meant to break, right? So some of these things can be adapted to, to your workflow or your needs. Okay, so now the third point, uh, comments. So, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> so they say that um, code is like a joke because I mean comments, this should be comments, sorry. Comments, 
Ah, no, no, it's okay. Code is like a joke. When you have to explain it is bad. So if you use comments to explain your code, that means you have bad code and your code is not clean. Um, so in general, the guidelines is you should almost never comment your code. We're gonna see what almost is, but in general, I'd say if you just want to put some explanation on on what something does, probably that's a, uh, that that means that you should write better names of functions and, and variables. Um, also, try to remove any unnecessary and misleading comments. Like I mentioned, uh, also at the beginning, comments are uh, are not the source of truth. You probably put a comment saying, "Oh, this should be doing this," and when you wrote the code, you did another thing, and now your comment is basically uh, misleading. And also try to delete the code. Uh, it's not like when when we were in in school, like you you were commenting codes to try to debug, and then remove it because um, not, you wanted to keep it for later. Uh, basically, if, if if you comment code, just delete it because you have version control right now. We uh, I I think most of you or are using some kind of version control, GitHub, SVN. Some, I mean, Git, SVN, or something like that. Uh, so it's safe to delete the code because it was probably uh, co committed uh, before. And if we, we need to get back, we just need to look at the history, right? And finally, if you need, this is the almost part of the you should never comment your code. Uh, if you really need a long explanation, it's better to just have a wiki or a readme. Uh, and just link to that because probably that thing will be easier to maintain than your comment. When, when you have a wiki or a, or a readme, you just write it down and, and pop, if tracking GitHub, then you just push it and some people will say, oh, that they don't need to uh, review code, right? It's just like uh, you push a, a, a readme, it's even easier because you update the wiki and that's it. Uh, oh yeah, problem with links is that it's broken on the future. That's right. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's that's the only difficult part of that. So I, I will fall on, on the readme part, but if you maintain a, a healthy wiki, that should be fine too. But yeah, uh, that, that that's something tricky. You know, when you have long explanations, you also, if you read a, a, needle, a, a long explanation, most of the time will be because you're doing something with performance, like I mentioned a couple of slides ago, and and not because you're explaining something uh, that could be explained with with uh, with the name of your variables or something like that. You most probably will be writing things like, "Oh, I did this hack because of this and this and that," and if I did it this way, it will not work, right? That's probably the things that you can comment so that people in the future don't change your your hacks. And um, yeah, and the other thing is that even if you write it on a wiki on a readme, people won't read it most of the time. So it's better to have it just on the code. All right, so four point error handling. Uh, don't be this guy. <laughs> so whenever you're handling uh, errors, try to throw them instead of just returning error codes. Uh, we're gonna see why, I have an example of that, but basically if you return something like uh, 400 or 500 because that's an, an error and you expect that whoever used your function expect that in, integer with 500, uh, that's not cool. Or probably you have codes like one, two, three, four, five and each one have a meaning. Uh, that's a problem because pro when, when your function throws that, that code, the people receiving that will need to know what that means that they need to, to go to the wiki or something like that. So that's not good. It's better to throw exceptions because in the exception you can put text explaining what happened, right? Um, also when working with uh, functions that, that have errors or, or that throw exceptions, catch them, but handle them correctly. What does this mean? Try to, um, to log useful information that describes the scenario and Sorry, and basically not just log like, oh, there was an error. Now try to do things like, oh, there was an error in this function, probably even in this file, uh, because I received this program and this wasn't found in this part, 
right or something like that so so that anyone reading the logs um, can can basically uh, replicate the problem uh, also use tools to help you track those things uh, like Splunk, New Relic, anything that uh, gives you some visibility on what's happening on your server uh, or on, or um, or in, even in client side because uh, well you 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 know that probably is not a good practice to uh, log errors client side because the clients or well in the front end you you can see the errors and and basically people will be looking at what errors your program has. Uh, you you can have some kind of API uh, like New Relic or or Splunk where you can send those logs and and then watch them in in your server. Any questions so far? Okay, so the final point. Um, write for your peers. <clears throat> and oh yeah, well I I'll leave you some time to read the meme. Uh, basically, well, I, I, I saw that some of you are freelancers, but even if you don't have peers, you will be your own peer in the future. So um, basically try to uh, to work as if you were working with peers because your yourself from uh, two to three months uh, won't remember anything that you did or most of the things that you did. So try to be good with that person. Uh, Agree on code styles and, and enforce them. Basically, like uh, we just mentioned about the uh, underscores or camel case, also space versus tabs, braces, sh uh, if the braces should go aside or below, all of those things try, try to, to agree with your team and, and enforce them. We're gonna see how to enforce them at the end, but j just first agree on what should be the style for your team. And this could, could change from team to another. Yeah, consistency. Um, oh, this got, okay, <laughs> for some reason that was slow. Um, also have regular per programming sessions to avoid the hero programmer when you're doing something that it's gonna be complicated and and you know that it's gonna need some maintenance in the future, try to do some per programming sessions because the hero programmer can, uh, can, can probably be the only one that does that feature but if you go with that person, oh, good question. So, someone else is asking what is pair programming. Uh, pair programming is uh, basically when two people are in one computer, one is making the code and the other one is like giving direction and you can swap places. Uh, you can look for pair programming in Google and you'll see uh, a better definition than what I just give. Uh, but but yeah, basically is that. So that way uh, it's, it's a way to, to pass uh, some knowledge of what you're doing. And basically when you finish that feature per programming, uh, to both people will have the knowledge of that feature, right? So that's that's a really good win-win. And also the code will uh, have more quality and a lot of uh, things that come when, when you do per programming. Um, so other thing is, um, oh, I, I, there was some something that mentioned, yeah. Some people mentioned code reviews. Actually, that's the last part of this. So I'll, I'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, yeah, and okay. So also something that you should avoid with your team is to use cool things just because it's the trendy thing or uh, this, you know, there's this new library that is not even in alpha. <laughs> it's like 0 0.0.1 but you want to use it because it looks so cool. Yeah, try to avoid those things when you're working with your team because you, everything you put into your project, everyone else needs to learn it, right? So only if you have a good reason, try, um, and you should add things to your project. Uh, also, there's this thing called the voice scout rule, which is basically leave the campground cleaner than you found it. If you're working with a team, most probably you will find things that, uh, um, well, parts of the code that you, are seeing that is not clean code and you can improve it. So a good way to have a, a cleaner code every time you commit something is that if you work with something that wasn't clean, you just clean it up, uh, do a PR and uh, well, a pull request or send for review. And basically you're you're helping to, um, you know, like if, if you were seeing a, a place with a lot of trash cans and stuff like that, 
you, you, if you clean that, you, you are not just cleaning for yourself, you're cleaning for your team too, right? So whenever someone runs into that part of the code again, they, they will save a lot of time. And finally, uh, the, the uh, create a code review culture. Uh, oh, okay, so there's a good question here. If is a legacy application lacking all of this? Uh, I will say that legacy, I mean, it depends on your concept of what is legacy. Legacy is like, you're not able to change it or is something that you can change, but it's really old or basically something that you don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, in any of those three cases, you, okay, it's really old. Uh, so hopefully it has tests. If it doesn't have tests, then it's gonna be really complicated. Um, but what, what I will say, if you want to uh, understand the legacy system and try to fix some parts that uh, are the parts that, are, that you need to change because of your new requirement or your new feature, do that. Like try to change small parts and start small. Don't try to do a big uh, refactor of everything. And if that's not possible because uh, it's really old and it's not maintained and probably is not from your company, it's from other company, uh, I will say try to strangle it. I, I will write the word because probably I didn't pronounce it well, but strangle like, oh, sorry, I, I sent it privately, sorry. Uh, basically what you can do is certain features that you need to change, you start making them in your system and use them instead of the legacy code. So. Uh, so basically you will be uh, creating new features that mimic the ones in the legacy system little by little until you get rid of the legacy system. Um, what if the code doesn't passion you? Oh, okay. So uh, I think probably <laughs> I will say, um, hmm, that's a tricky question. Like if you don't like the way the code is written, I say sometimes it's easier to just make it your own. <laughs> Uh, at least little by little too, but uh, if not use a, a strangle pattern, pa uh, pattern. You can look for, for this strangle pattern. We're gonna talk a little bit at the end about patterns, but that's a pattern that basically says that like you make something new, uh, replacing part of the old system. And and basically now you, you will be passionate because it will be your own code, right? Hopefully. <laughs> um, and well, Getting back to uh, creating a code review culture, uh, when a team is just making PRs and not reviewing uh, the, well, who, who many of you, or who doesn't know what's a PR? Because I've been mentioning like a lot. It's a pull request. This is a concept from GitHub. Uh, but basically it's when you send your code to be reviewed by your peers. It, in GitLab, it's a code review request, or I don't remember, merge request, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll just merge request. Um, so whenever your team is making a lot of this and they're not reviewing because they makers, they, they feel that, that they should not be reading code, uh, try to schedule one hour meetings and, and do collective PRs basically so that the, the PRs like we mentioned on the per programming sessions are a way to uh, to let know your peers what you've been working on and and so that everyone knows what parts of the system do what instead of having the hero coder. All right, so these are the five points. Oh, and actually I, I have a good example here. This just happened yesterday. Uh, try, try to be polite. This is something really important. Try not to be like super rude saying like, hey, this looks ugly. This is super bad code. Now we, we should try to, to do things like, for example, here we have a simple if statement and what I said is it was like, hey, I had to read this a couple of times. It was, it was difficult to understand basically. And what about this? And, I, and the cool thing about GitHub, I'm not sure if, if GitLab has it, probably it, it has. You can uh, give some um, feedback or some uh, basically code to replace what they had so that they, they know what you're thinking. All right. So, now let, let's do the recap. So these are the five points. We, we, we just saw meaningful names, single responsibility principle, comments, error handling, 
and writing 40 peers. And I see that we are at six now. So we have just half hour for the exercise. I tried to go really fast, but try to bear with me. Um, so let's do some live coding. Um, I have this code pen collection. Oh, for some reason, I have the pen on, <laughs> on Zoom. Sorry. OK, cool. If you want to follow along, I, I will say try to only um, try, try to see. This is a link to the collection of the exercises. But if you want to follow along and code, that's fine. Um, but I will, you, you, you can probably just watch right now because I'm going to go fast because of the lack of time. And then if you, if you want to uh, exercise, you can take that link and, and do it by yourself. All right. So this is the simplest one. Um, here we have a function. And this function only returns this string. And basically, we just log it. Uh, anything you're noticing here? I, I did this super simple for starters so that you can give me some suggestion. I have this bad collection of my code works. That would be cool if you if you did like a, an encyclopedia of those. That would be great. <laughs> so, any suggestions on on this? Okay, yeah. So there's no abbreviations. That's cool. Yeah. So in, instead of get mess get ms msg, it's get message, and we should change that here too. Uh, and should be name, okay. That that's another cool thing because it's a one letter variable that we don't want that. Uh, oh, the message variable too. Yeah, that's right. Cool. And in the test, yeah, I I told you that you didn't not notice the test. Um, I on purpose set up this. This is just Mocha running a simple test. Like I run this and it should return this. So that's why in the right you're seeing that it, it is not passing. So yeah, let's change that. And here too. All right. Uh, okay, someone is saying use an anonymous function if it only has a return statement. Uh, that's tricky. Uh, if we use an anonymous function, we won't be able to use this in other parts of the system. It will depend uh, on our requirements. But um, I, I will say that you should not overuse anonymous function. And actually, I'm going to tell you why. This is a good thing that happened because I, I wanted someone to mention about that anonymous function. So this is an example. Can you see this code? I'm going to make it a little bigger. OK. So this is an, uh, a one-liner that basically says uh, is making some transformation, right? Um, the thing is that. Uh, even if this is like one-liner, the when when you transpile with Babel or something, it will end up being like this. So, I will say try to do uh, functions by name. I mean, uh, self-explanatory instead of doing these kind of things because this is just obfuscating uh, the purpose of the function, right? Even if this, if you want to do functional, uh, I mean one-liner. I mean. Functions that are one line, you can do do them like this. For example, uh, sec, I mean, it's minutes to milliseconds equal this, and that will be better, right? At least. <laughs> but yeah, as you and well, we also should change this to to minutes. And we're gonna see a couple of examples of. How can we change this? But yeah, try try not to overuse uh, anonymous functions and one-liner or or arrow functions just because. Um, sorry, I probably missed a lot of things. I'm reading right now. Uh, get message might be misleading. Yeah, we need probably more context to know what kind of message we're we're uh, returning. So that's a good one. We probably say here. Uh, Instead of get, 
create greeting because this is a greeting rec and probably this is more clean. And now we can keep improving this. This is the, uh, the, the, the main thing um, that I wanted to teach you. Like, this is not like uh, something super exact. Like you, will, you won't know when you're done. Like your code probably can be cleaner, can be cleaner. So uh, you have to have uh, a good uh, balance between, um, well, to know when to stop or when, when it's enough, right? So yeah, that's, that's for this first one. Let's get back to, to the uh, next one. Yeah, sometimes it's a matter of opinion. That's why <clears throat> also pair programming and code reviews go into this. <coughs> Sorry. Because uh, basically you and your peers, as uh, if you keep doing pair programming and code reviews, we'll start having like one mind. We'll start converging or having a middle ground for these kind of things, right? So what, probably at the start you will have two really separate opinions, but little by little, you will get closer to one that likes for, uh, that, that is good enough for, for both of you or for all your team. All right. So <clears throat> the second scenario, we have a user. This is a, a, a user with uh, three fields, name, an ID, an email. And we have three functions to get the name, to get the ID, to get, get the email. Let's imagine that we need this for some reason, probably it's super redundant, but bear with me, try to, to imagine that, that, uh, that these are, are used somewhere. And well, they're, they're actually used here in, in, in the tests, right? So, all right, so what, what are your suggestions? Yeah, so, okay, well, there's one that says that it should be part of the class. We don't have a class right now, but yeah, probably if it was a class instead of an object, yeah, I will put the, those methods in, in a class. But yeah, consistency in, in function names, that's, that's the main thing. So instead of username, client ID, customer email, and also you, you see we have this get here, uh, we should have some consistency, right? So Let's say it's user because the, the the object is user too. So get user email get instead of client user ID. And finally get username. We should also change this. You, you see I have a I have tests, so I know when I screw it up. And if I replace this here and this here. So yeah, another thing, the delete comments. This is redundant. Get user email already tells me that it is getting an email, right? So that's fine. Um, what else? Let me see. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the to 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 the ones I know uh, because probably we we will get short in time. But uh, but, ah yeah, I, I forgot to change user here. Sorry. And also other thing that is redundant is that this is inside user, so why username? It could be just name. Here it could be ID. Here it could be email. And that's it, right? We just need to change them in, in the other parts. And also in the test probably. Um, oh, very good. Okay. Also, I, some, something I forgot to tell you is that all of these exercises have the solution here in the CSS part. So if you want to see then later uh, with more uh, calm these, these solutions, you can get back to the, let's go to the third one. Yeah, I like that when I'm doing these changes, uh, you're mentioning all the principles and everything we've been seeing, so that's cool. All right, so what do we have here? Here is, here's something that I didn't mention in, in the slides that is called magic numbers. This 18 
if it wasn't for for the comment i wouldn't know what what it is right but this 18 is is probably the legal age to drink so let's change that to be legal age to drink see when when i mentioned uh, long name variables this is what i was referring to probably this is a good case of it's okay to have it have a long name um here's another long uh, magic number this is the beer price so let's do that too Okay. Oh, and then the ifs. Yeah, that's getting tricky. Okay. Oh, a question. Why is it called magic number? Uh, because when we had it like that, it it seemed like magic. Like uh, the number was making the program work magically. We don't know the reason behind that number. That's why they they're called magic numbers. <laughs> Oh yeah, another thing is that if you agree with the team, you can use brackets always, even if it's just one, one line. That's something that, that, that you can do. We can remove this comment because we now are using the beer price and the H to drink. You can group the if with a, a condition, right? That's another thing we can do. Um, so yeah, this could be an end basically, but here's the thing. Uh, yeah, well, let's see first if test passes. If not, then that wasn't a good refactor. Yeah, tests are passing, so all good. Uh, this is when things are starting to getting out of hand because you have, well, it's just two, two things, but it's difficult to read, right? Because it's getting long, probably in the smaller screens, if you have something like this, it will be hard to read, but uh, we're gonna see how to fix that in a moment. Uh, oh, the constants in JavaScript should be uppercase. That's also something that depends on on the on the style you you are using with your team because it it's a constant. It, it won't change if you try to change it inside here. So that depends on on your style. And we're gonna see that about well, I think about styles at the end. Um, okay, we're gonna not get in, into this. Let's imagine that we're reading a CSV. So some people are saying that we should change into a JSON. But you know what? Yeah, actually we can do that. Instead of doing this split, because we don't know what's happening here, we can probably have a function that tells us that uh, something like a parse user, right? Because that's happening here. And we send the, the CSV. Or it could be even parse user CSV. And sorry, function parse user csv we receive the csv again and then uh, we were returning this but uh, what about doing it adjacent like it was mentioned so we can probably do a constant like um, if, if you don't know about the structuring uh, i recommend you to do that that's something that javascript does in, since es 2015 so we know that the first thing is the name, the second one is the age, and the third one is the money. And we can return that, uh, an object with that structure, name, age, and money, right? So then this is no longer a user array. This is now a, a user with those properties. And instead of here, this was hiding also what, what, what were we uh, comparing? So. Now we're checking user dot age to if you see if it is uh, larger than the legal age to drink and user dot money right. Uh, some people is saying are saying just return the if yeah that's another option we we can do. Uh, but what about um, extracting this logic because probably uh, this is, um, imagine that in the future, someone tells you like, oh, apart from checking its age, it should have an ID. The people drinking should have an ID. 
so you should have an, an, another, uh, basically another check here to see if the user gave its ID. So uh, probably we can extract this to can, can legally drink and we pass the, the user and we do this. I know this might seem like overkill, but uh, in the long run, pro probably it will be uh, more maintainable. The same for this, can, can buy beer or a forest beer even better. And, and now it will be easier to just return this because return can legal drink and a forest beer rates way much better, right? So yeah, there's a bunch of things we can keep doing and, and probably you will have solved it differently and that's fine. But, uh, that's what I try to get here. What, what I'm saying is just not the absolute truth. So if you see this is not like the, the thing that you should have done, it's more like some guidelines on how I should, I will have solved it, but you can do it different, right? So yeah, this, this looks better, right? So let's go to the next one. Oh yeah, that that's something I missed. That someone in the chat is saying that the uh, we all all of the functions were receiving a user. Probably we can restructure the arg arguments. And actually, if you see the 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 solution in the CSS, I uh, I, I made the function so that it only receives the age and and the money because it doesn't care about the name, right? So you can change that too. Okay, so this is another one. This is a really cool one because um, sometimes we, we see this and say like, oh, it's fine. But uh, sometimes we could say like, oh, we should use a switch statement because it will look better. Uh, so what would you say? Okay, we have magic strings, not necessarily. Uh, yeah, so basically what, uh, uh, the, uh, the the thing we should avoid here is using a lot of else if well a lot of if statements because in the long run it's more difficult to maintain and also uh, it's super uh, well it's less performant because imagine that, that I put laptop it has to check all of the ones before laptop to to return it right so yeah most people is mentioning a, a dictionary so that's cool so these are like short names let's say we have a constant called uh, short names dictionary. And you can use a map, you can use a lot of things, but I will just use an object for now where I put my pairs of uh, long and short. And just bear with me. Meanwhile, you can keep, uh, you, you can write what, what what else can we do? And well, now that we have this dictionary, how can we do that? How can we use it to avoid the, the ifs? Well, I, I won't remove the ifs until I, I, I do the change, but basically you can say my short name is short names dictionary with the key of my string. Actually, I don't like string, probably this should be name because that's, it could even be long name because you have the long name and then the short name, but probably name is fine. And now that um, that we have this, um, oh, I, we're having a problem because we have a, a lot of returns here. And, and I, I, I haven't returned anything yet. So, oh, someone is saying that uh, return short name or 404. So yeah, that will be probably the next thing. 
I, I will just say like, okay, uh, use this or only if your team likes to do the things this way too. And yeah, that's the other thing. We should not be using that 404 in the first place. <laughs> so, well, after deleting the, the ifs, uh, let's let's do something. Let's check if we have a short name. If we do, then return it, right? This is called um, fast returning. Like if you have something and that's it, you just return it instead of having a lot of if else. And then if we don't have a short name, probably we want to throw an, an error. So Oh, remove the not found. Yeah, we, we need to remove this because we want to throw an error now. So let's uh, throw error. And probably you will be tempted to do this. But I would recommend even better to have something like this. Uh, the name of the function probably you can do something more, more scalable, but for now, let's use the name of the function that, and let's say name not found in short names dictionary, right? And the same for, for the console log. Actually, instead of console log, I will use console error. If it was front end, I, I will remove this, <laughs> but if it was back end, I will do a console error with the same thing so that, that I can track it in, in Splunk or something. But um, I will put here error message to reduce it. All right. And Let's see. So we're getting this error because we have a test that says, okay, return 404 if a variation wasn't found. So now we don't want that. We just want uh, to, to throw an error. So we can change the test to, to check for that error. Actually, I have the line here just to be quicker. Uh, so I'm gonna just copy paste this, sorry, to, to make it faster, but basically it throws an error if the abbreviation wasn't found. And that's better for our, our, our test. This is the other thing I wanted to mention that not the tests are not always uh, something that should be trusted. So if, if your test is doing something that is not clean code, you should also change them. All right, cool. So that's it for, for this part. Let's go to the fifth one. We have eight minutes. Um, I'm going to do a quick poll. Um, how many of you can stay? I mean, can, can you stay after 6.30? I'm going to relaunch the, the poll because this is taking longer. P please answer the, 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 the poll. For those that, that don't, um, yeah, I don't think it will be too long. We, we only have... Uh, Two more scenarios, I think. No, it wasn't. We were on five or six. Uh, let five is next. Yeah, so I will say fifteen minutes. So six forty-five will be, uh, and I will make this faster so that we can see the last topics. All right. So the majority. That's cool. Let, let's keep it then. Um, now for the fixed, fifth exercise, we have these users and we have basically a bunch of users, um, well, the, in an array with name, if they are disabled, their email, and if they have coupons. Then we have a, um, yeah, so for some reason, it's the, the poll is getting in my way, so I'm just gonna remove it. Send coupons list. Um, basically, what is doing it looks pretty simple, but actually, there's a lot of things happening here that shouldn't be. Um, so, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna mention and doing do them. Um, you can keep uh, saying in the chat what you think we should do, but yeah, removing the comments. So, 
that's one. <laughs> um, so basically this list doesn't tell me anything. It's a user list actually, or like we just said users instead because this might be misleading. And yeah, this free course should be a constant probably. Okay, so this is probably a course code. Then what? Um, th there's a, a, a interesting thing here. Even though we have this for loop, um, and, and it seems pretty simple, it's doing two things, right? So yeah, some people is mentioning using functional programming like map or something. So uh, first, let's, let, let's see why this is a problem uh, because we, what we're doing is that here, the user's coupons, we're pushing the code. So we are modifying the original list, right? Um, if we run the test, we're running the test two times. And if we check the, the first user, we basically just added two courses. Even though uh, their tests, they should be separate. They should not be uh, um, like, having the results of the last test, right? So the problem is that we are modifying the, the original. We are, uh, we, we are basically changing the original uh, variable. So what we can do, um, okay, some people are mentioning find, but find for what? Using the array prototype find. Okay, well, if, if you answer, I'll, I'll read that. Uh, but first I will say, let's separate um, things by having a, a send mail uh, function, because that's a, a, another thing. To users. I'm not sure if I, I should, uh, no, sorry. This should be more like send coupon email because we don't we only that's the other thing we are not seeing here or we are seeing here that we only send to the enabled users right and that's because of the coupon or something so we will send the users and basically here we can do a, a um, functional programming using for each instead of a for i'm not saying that for each is better than for it's, it's just simpler if you're used to functional programming. So we have the user and then we just email that user dot email, right? Ah, but we, we need to filter the disabled ones. So that's why I made this functional because we want first to filter if the user is not disabled. Right, so now we separate that and the cool thing is that now uh, this function, it's only now doing just one thing and we can actually, ah, there's an invitation here. We, we can actually also transform this to functional to remove this, uh, this ugly code that is changing or ref by reference the users. So I'm gonna keep the four besides just so that, so that you can compare, but let's say new, well, user, new users, just to call it away. I'm not good with names. So <laughs> if you have a better name, you can probably put it in the chat, but we're gonna go through users and map them. So basically if the user is disabled, we just return in as it is because we don't want to make changes due to that user, right? Uh, all right, is just disabled, not is disabled. So good catch. And then <clears throat> if Okay, if the user is disabled, just return it. If not, we're gonna add the coupon. So how do we do that? 
we can just use some restructuring to clone the user. Then for the coupons, we can also clone the, the coupons that that people that person had, and then just add the, the course code that we're adding. So now we, um, that, that we're returning these, the new users we have will have that and we didn't change this one. So we will be able to return those new users. And the thing here is that now we need to change um, the, the, the test. Oh, I'm not deleting this comment because this on purpose, like it's simulating the email sending. <laughs> Um, so here we, we have a problem, just uh, coupons is not defined. All right, this should be users, user.coupons. And now the problem is that we are having a broken test here because our use, well, our tests are using the function the old way. So now here we have also new users. And this is the thing we should check now on our tests. And as you can see, we just added it once because even if it's running twice, we these new users is just the one that we got from, from this function instead of the accumulative uh, result of the other two functions, right? We can keep on that. Here's the, the solution if you want to keep on that, but let's go to, to the last one. So this is another interesting one. We have long lines, really long lines. So for example, this is something I like to call clever code because it's trying to do everything in one line. And that's something that uh, clever people and I'm saying clever with quotes, uh, but instead they're just complicating things, right? Because here we have some duplicated code that might be difficult to 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 see if you if you have it this way. So yeah, let's let's go through all of the things really quick. We have magic numbers. We have basically pi. Here and here. And <clears throat> what else? We have redundant code because this is the same as this. But first, let me remove the, the clever code. It is removed like if no decimals. And you're going to see why it's, it's good to remove clever code. When you do this step by step, then we just return this one. This is when you notice that this is the same as this, right? So probably you can just calculate it here. And here. And that's easier to read, even if it's more lines, right? But uh, you will say, oh, we're having more kilobytes of, <laughs> of code because we have a lot of uh, more uh, code in, instead of the one line we had before, right? But the thing is that uh, we're writing for humans, not for computers. And actually Babel and Webpack and or wherever we're using to transpile our code, will transform this to a more optimized thing, minimized. So we don't need to care about kilobytes or, well, at, at least in this part of, 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 the, of the system, right? It, it, that's something we, we should care about when, we, when we're working with web, Webpack and configuring it. Um, what else do we have? So it's the same for all of them. So probably what we can do, since all of them are using the no decimals thing, we can have a variable called area that starts with zero. At the end, we will return there. So we can do just this, like um, assigning it. And at the end, if it was asked, ask to us that we need no decimals, then we return the math floor one. If not, we return the regular one, right? So in all of these lines, we just need to do area equals this, area 
equals this and not return it here, right? So that was just over complicating things. Um, what else? Uh, well, here, this is starting to look like uh, our ifs in the third scenario. So we can do the same instead of, a, uh, well, kind of a dictionary. Uh, but well, the cool thing about JavaScript, I'm not sure if all, all of the language has this, probably not, but many modern languages have, we can have an area um, calculator or function. I'm not sure which uh, could be better. So area functions, this could also be a map or something. We're gonna use an object and basically have, if it is a circle, then this will be a function that will receive um, I will say a shape. Oh, wait, before doing this, uh, don't make me, we'll get back to this. We need to remove all of these uh, things because we have a lot of, uh, of things that are not used. Like width is just for square and rectangles. Radius is only for circles. So why not just getting the shape? That would be the ideal thing, right? So also something we can do is remove the no decimals parts, part, sorry, and do a function called get area without decimals. We just send the shape. And what we can do is return actually the call to get area with this, that same shape, but we wrap it in a map floor. Right, so we can remove this from here. And also from here. So now that we have that, we only need the shape. So let's remove all of these because the shapes, each one has their own properties, right? So why sending everything? And here we can just change it to shape dot radius. Dot width. Shape dot height. And now we can, well, we, we're, all our tests are failing because we just need to send the shape. So let's do that. Let's remove all of that. This one is the one that needs uh, the, that doesn't want the decimals. And this one with the shape, same for this. So let's see if we're good. As you can see, I'm going step by step. So these are kept, are, are still broken for some reason. Oh, it's because I need to change the name here. And we're good to go now. So finally, well, uh, to not take so, too long for this, basically we just put these results here and we can, at, at the beginning of this, we can just uh, have an area function. And I'm not sure if that's the best name because probably it's, because it's better like area formula or something, but let's call it area function for now. And uh, let's send the shape dot name. So that way we just, uh, we, we will get the, the, the function and then uh, we can just return area function with the shape. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I, I just wanna wrap this up. Uh, if you want to, to see the final one, here it is, but basically it's just putting all of these formulas in, in the definitions, right? Uh, okay, all right, yeah. Here instead of this, it goes like this. Yeah, I probably have typos because I'm rushing this to, to finish on time, but uh, the, the correct answer or one working solution, I will say is here. So you can copy and paste uh, that here and it should work, right? So let's head back to the presentation. Oof, it's getting hot. <laughs> so now that we've seen a lot of scenarios and we are getting used to that, how can we enforce it, right? This is the, the critical part if we're working with, with a team. Um, there are many tools we can use. 
Um, so basically having a test suit like we've been doing in, in, in the scenarios, uh, if we didn't have that test suit, uh, it will be harder for me to catch the box, right? So it's easier to clean code if you have box. Uh, yeah, people are mentioning other things, PRs, linters, yeah, so we, we'll get to that. But this is automation, so PRs are not automated so far. Well, if, if you have some CICD, but we'll see that later. Um, but yeah, test suit will help if you, um, most, most of you probably won't have any tests in your code and that's fine, but try to at least add a, a test suit and add some unit tests to critical parts of your system. You'll thank me for that later. Um, also prettier, uh, well, this is specific to JavaScript. Probably there are other uh, similar for other languages, but prettier helps you with all of the things that you were mentioning, like what if I want to use underscores? What if I want to not use ifs with curly braces? Or well, have always curly braces and stuff like that. So let me show you how prettier works. Basically the code in, in the left has a lot of ifs, all of them are the same. But Prettier, what it does is that you set a set of rules and basically Prettier will change it to be consistent, right? And you can have this for your editor and also, uh, well, basically you can run a command line uh, operation or, or just having a, a, a module or a plugin in your editor and it will change it automatically to, to this. You can even set it up when saving, when you save it will change things up so that you and your team have the same rules for uh, how things should be, right? Um, other thing is ESLint or a code linter. Um, I'm gonna show you also some uh, a demo of ESLint. Um, basically, it's, it's something like Prettier, but Prettier doesn't catch everything. Like Prettier could catch uh, things like where the curly braces are, but for example, Prettier probably won't catch, I'm not sure if, don't quote me on this, but probably won't catch if you have a variable that is not used, right? So ESLIN will do that. Also, if you are really strict and you don't want console logs, you can put a, a rule that doesn't let you put console logs. There it is. So instead of catching those when you are reviewing your, your, your code or your peer score, and you can have things like this beforehand so that they warn you that you're doing something that might be uh, not clean. And there's a lot of rules. You, I, I won't get to, to see all of these, but basically you can even uh, check for tabs. So uh, here it is, unexpected tab char character. So yeah. Yeslin will help you to have all of these checks automatically too, so that that's cool. And yeah, some ideas let you set up stricter lean validations. Yeah, and most of them is basically uh, configuration of, of this. So you can configure these as strict as you want, or uh, the way uh, on a, or in a way that works for your team. But all of these you can have it and still send code uh, dirty to 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 your repository, right? So that's why you can use something like Husky that basically runs uh, all of these things we saw before in, in GitHub or in Git hooks. So whenever, for example, here, whenever before pushing, anyone wants to push something, it will check with uh, NPM run, well, it will lint and run the tests. And if some of those don't pass, then it won't get to, to Git. Uh, so that's a way to enforce it. And the other way to enforce it, which is even better is to have uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline uh, that you can connect with GitHub or, or GitLab and it will tell you when something is failing. So you can even put uh, some blocks so that you cannot merge if, if well, one, if you're not, if the code is not approved and two, if it is not passing the test or the lins, linter or, or something like that, right? So this is the other way to, to automate it. Yeah, you can use Jenkins to, there are tools, we should have one tool of this. So that's why I'm, I'm mentioning uh, these, these things. And finally, this is, be, this is gonna be super fast because I told you that I was gonna end 45. So uh, code smells. Code smells is basically what we've been mentioning in the exercises, but it's basically a characteristic in the source code of the program that 
probably indicates a deeper problem. That's a polite way to say it, but well, code smells comes from when you are reading bad code that is really, really ugly, your face will basically look like this. And it looks like if someone opened a, a baby diaper or something like that, right? So, so yeah, that's why the, the name. And what it, it is useful for? Well, basically to name the scenarios and communicate to others easily, like magic numbers uh, we, you were mentioning. Uh, they can be categorized can be linked to many treatments, like, oh, when you have this code, mess, code smell, you can do this other thing, right? And also knowing about them helps you bet, get better code sense to identify them quickly, some kind of spider sense to know when the code is not clean. So here's a, a link, I'm, I'm gonna try to paste it. No, I cannot paste it, but uh, yeah, hopefully I can send the presentation to you, but um, yeah, this link is really cool because they have the, the catalog of the of the smells. You can probably take a screenshot of it and then type it. And finally, refactoring. Refactoring, I won't go deep into this uh, because it's what basically we've been doing in the exercises, but it's a process to restructure uh, your code without changing the behavior. And what helps you to, oh, thanks for the link in, in the chat. And what helps you to, to avoid changing the external behavior well, uh, basically the tests, and if the tests are good enough, they and you're not breaking them, it means that you are changing the code without changing the, the external behavior, right? And most most of the time, when we're doing clean code, we focus on the maintainability and adaptability, not on performance, because well, probably you saw in some exercises, but in some cases we were iterating more times, so it, probably we could have. Worst, worsened the, the performance in some of those cases, but the readability was improved, right? So this is the main focus when, when we're doing clean code. And they also can be categorized for easier communication. And um, they, they should be done with enough tests, small changes, step-by-step step, like we were doing, and committing code that all, always works because we never have time to refactor, right? So we can probably do a little bit of refactor here, a little refactor there, but probably we have to hit a deadline. So that's why we should keep it working with the tests and just push it and eventually we will have a, a cleaner codex, right? And finally, these are the books for that. And both are the same book, just the one in the right is the newer, the newest one. And this one is, well, the newest one is focused on JavaScript. The other one is on Java, so if you, uh, prefer one of those languages, then you have a clear pick. If not, then it depends. If you uh, want something fresher, with, uh, it will be the one in the right. But if you uh, are using, a, well, I, I will say, I, I was going to say, if you're using class based languages, use the one in the left. But the one in the right also uses JavaScript with classes. So I guess just check which one works better for you. And finally, QA. Do you have any any questions? I know it, it was like a lot, a lot of information, but um, yeah, if you have something that wasn't covered in in, in this uh, presentation, I can answer right now. So I'm gonna give uh, ten seconds. No questions. Okay, cool. If not, you can ping me on Twitter, probably. So yeah, all right. So before you go, uh, help me filling uh, this feedback survey. It helped us a lot to, uh, I'm actually gonna paste this one in the chat so that you can fill it faster. Um, it helps us a lot to to get better, to improve, to, to, um, to basically know what, um, what, are, what other courses you, you want to. So I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to, to fill this one. You, you can also, if you already filled it and uh, you can ask something, you know. Oh yeah, my Twitter is this one. All right, um, let me see if 
Carolina is in the line. I'm not sure if she wants to give some ad advice or something. Yes, Carol, are I'm you here. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, well, no, no announcements. Just thank you very much, Heather. Thank you for spending your, your time doing, doing this. And thank you to everyone who, who connected. Uh, thanks to you, Academy Exist and Academy Keep Growing. So please follow us on our social media. Let us know what else you want to learn and recommend us as well. And well, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much, Edir, and everyone who, who's here. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you, you enjoyed it and, and see you soon then. <laughs>